really cool, but so far you don't think that there's no, there no, there's no life there. And then this spectacular one with this ring, uh, this rings and rings of ice. Wow, pretty, pretty neat, and, but still no life yet that you can detect. A great big huge gas giant with this angry red spot going around it. And then there's this interesting kind of rocky planet, travel some more, <gasps> and there's this beautiful blue swirling marble, and that catches your attention. This one looks like it has some potential. Well, all your scientific um, instruments indicate that there's something going on here, that there's something alive down here. This is really exciting. So you land your spacecraft. And you end up in this um, large continental peninsula, really big. And it's the jungly underbrush. And you creep out of your spaceship, and you see these creatures. And they're strutting around and they're calling and making rah, rah, rah. And when you look at these creatures through the eyes of, of where this is not your home planet, how could you possibly, possibly design anything more, more beautiful than what's already here? These are two very real animals. Their names are Jade and Snow. Jade and Snow the peacock. Two male peacocks, they lived at the Oakland Zoo. They might still be living there at the Oakland Zoo, but that's who they are. And uh, so when you look at what we have, life around us, you start to look and appreciate animals with a whole, whole new eyes. This piece could be used both as fine art, it could be an illustration about birds, it could be used for um, concept development to hand to the production team who are going to model real peacocks. Because in this day and age, there are there's a whole bunch of potential if you're able to model and create real animals rather than having trained animals that have minds of their own and, and perhaps will not do what the director wants them to do. Or for animal safety, for example, if you're able to create at least in part, digital horses. They haven't quite got that down right yet. But can you imagine? So the more that you understand animal anatomy and real creatures, the more you're going to be able to do naturally imaginary ones. So what happens if you're given an assignment and the director wants you to invent a biological griffin, not a chimera, not a magical griffin, but one that could actually live on our planet? What would happen? Well. I'll go through kind of maybe the process. So if I'm on the phone and I'm doodling here, thinking of what would a real griffin look like? And I'm thinking of what the Persians thought, the ancient Persians thought were real griffins. They discovered um, back thousands and thousands of years ago fossilized skulls of protoceratops, dinosaurs. Anybody have an idea? People know what protoceratops are? They're related to triceratops and Horned, horned dinosaurs? Well, they thought those were the skulls of griffins and, and invented their lion-like bodies to go with them. But I'm going to mix the DNA up a bit to see if I can get something that could be real. So because I've, I like drawing big cats and small cats and cats in general, I was doodling these griffins doing cat-like things. And I like to draw and paint cats, and here is perhaps one of the most feline of felines, an African spotted leopard, and uh, so that's a mother leopard, and her, um, her uh, little cub here. And it's always interesting to look at the proportions between an infant and what they grow into. I always find that a wonderful exercise, just in creature design, because there's the, the contrast between the baby and the mother. So, but I'm just loving the lines of this very, very elegant, wonderful creature, this, this leopard. Here's a reconstruction of a protoceratops, at least to the latest data. And there is evidence that they may have had quill-like feathers, at least on their spines from about the middle of the back. So here is a mother protoceratops. Here's her cub. 
See if I can. I need some extension. Here we go. So you mix the DNA, and perhaps you get a creature that looks like this, where you have a feline esque a body. It's not exactly the same as a leopard's, but you kind of get that idea of a cross. And you have a protoceratopsis like head, but it's not exactly the same as the dinosaur. And many, at least the, if we're going to cross species a little bit more, of the raptor type um, dinosaurs are thought to have had f wings on their forearms. So why not put them on this particular griffin? And I just went and blew the um, crest out a lot more so that could do some behaviors and a, bit, a little bit of eye candy. But here is this row of quill-like feathers. Well, it doesn't stop there. If you're designing for a movie, especially when it has a lot of details, say like a Star Wars type movie, it's always very helpful to give your production team as much information as possible because they're going to have to go ahead and sculpt a model that can be animated. Well, in order to animate something, you need anatomy because you can't get away from it. So here is what is called the slave skeleton or the slave rig. Inside this would be the vectored rig where they have the attachments to move the creature. But we, don't, but we want that extra layer of, believabil of believability so that you have the slave um, skeleton that encapsulates the slave rig. And then we have the models for the muscles. And then finally, we have the, the surface animal with all the texture mapping and such. And then, of course, new software has to be invented just to move these feathers about. Here is the female of the species, because in my little world, I'm the boss. And the females have, are black with uh, sapphire feathers. And the males are golden with magenta or amethyst feathers. There's the cub. And here's a concept illustration, a concept narrative illustration. Basically, what it means is an illustration that tells the story. As concept artists, visual development artists, whatever you want to call it, really, the broad term is we're illustrators. We tell stories. The most important thing, and this is you know, whether you're doing it in sculpting or you're doing it in two-dimensional, we're telling stories. We are illustrating a point to get across. And we have a grand heritage from the cave paintings to Rembrandt, the Sistine Chapel, to the Impressionists, to Norman Rockwell, to Dr. Seuss, and anyone else who has effectively been able to tell a great story. We're illustrators. That's our job. And illustration is the parent of the motion picture. So anyway, here is the, these animals in their native environment doing native animal behaviors, such as what you would observe in lions um, fighting over a carcass. And uh, these animals are designed to live in this rather rocky um, place, like snow leopards. And they don't really truly fly because they don't have the pectoral muscles necessary for that. However, when they leap, they leap glide. So when you're designing a creature, look at nature, look how efficient nature is, look how real animals move. So that if you're doing, for example, it's in a science fiction environment, as opposed to maybe a magical or fantasy environment, people can believe in your world and believe in these creatures. So let the real animals inform your make-believe animals. Here is another study of this griffin, this teasor, kind of focusing in on the anatomy of the armpit. And you know I've got this idea was from watching cougars, young cougars jumping, la 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 la. It's plain, but I thought, so cool. I mean, just look at these cougars jumping. And here are some more of the animals that live in that world. I, was in, I love as, um, 
David was saying he loves prehistoric mammals and I, I adore prehistoric mammals and um, that was what I had intended to do for most of my career. I still do a lot of um, paleo reconstruction work, um, but when I was, uh, my passion was always for real and prehistoric and especially with the mammals because, I don't know, because I like them, I guess. I don't have an explanation why. But anyway, these, are, these particular creatures are inspi inspired by obviously you know, pterodactyls and, and bats, but also elephant shrews and um, numbats from Australia and a prehistoric mammal called the Lepithidicus, which kind of bounds about like a little kangaroo, at least they thought it did. Um, here, and there's the baby because I like baby animals. And these are just kind of crosses between um, cyanodont, mammal-like reptiles, and thorny devils, and yes. This is a mood painting. This is where you are focusing on getting a mood, an emotion, an impression um, across. Uh, it's, it's done in a lot of, Pixar does a lot of this sort of thing, getting the feeling, they, use, they play around with color to help um, convey the, uh, the emotion. Uh, Disney's Bambi, the development of that, a lot of mood paintings. Um, so this is also kind of an important thing, and uh, this is an acrylic painting on a gessoed board because I wanted to get a particular texture of the, of the gesso that I couldn't replicate, I couldn't replicate this digitally. Um, but this, this is basically a, a California gray fox and reflecting the colors off the grapes. And I've, in real life, you're, it doesn't really, you know, reflect to this degree, but I'm augmenting reality to get this kind of tentative, tender, shy moment in time. Here is an illustration from my book, The Katurin Odyssey. Uh, this is where I'm working trad dig digitally, a combination of traditional and digital media. I drew the illustration on tracing paper. I then um, made a copy of it on a good quality office copier, like a Canon or a Xerox, that type of copier, not a printer, a copier. And, uh, the, and the, just to strengthen my graphic lines. Then I scanned it into Photoshop, painted it in Photoshop. Um, the text goes here. And basically it's a story of about a little lemur and a little ring-tailed lemur named Katuk and he's been banished from his island home and he has never, ever, ever seen the ocean and for him, going across the ocean, if you're an animal that's furry, about the size of a cat, this is like going into outer space from his perspective. He, it's just, he's not happy, not happy at all, but he's on the back of this leatherback turtle. And of course, the, to, the, the world, it's not the Earth, it's, it's, a, it's a planet that's like the Earth, and all species who have ever lived on our planet, both prehistoric and contemporary species, live on this planet called Katura. And they're all Katurans, basically, like we're all Earthlings. So this is during the day, going across um, the ocean, and all these predatory animals are like, we're really curious about this small furry animal. Like here's some Zygludont ancient whales, here's uh, contemporary dolphins, like white-sided dolphins, here's ichthyosaurs, we've got elephant seals, prehistoric cisticians, opas, or ocean sunfish. Um, I love marlin and sailfish. There's so, so wonderful. Uh, narwhals, because narwhals are wonderful too. Well, it doesn't get any easier for him at nighttime, which you'll see why. They're just, now you have a whole bunch of nighttime predatorial <laughs> carnivores that are just as curious about him, especially like um, leopard seals who are, are very, very dangerous animals. And they're like, hmm, they're like, no, no, let me go, oh, go away. But, in here. but it was so fun to just be able to put all these real animals in scenes together. And I asked myself, how can I possibly improve on them? It's like God took all the creature, good creature designs already, you know. So, all right, he's now on the main continental um, world, 
big continents. And this is a scene farther along in the story where Katuk and his friend, who, um, the Quagga, the Quigga, ha are joining up with his caravan. And it's a caravan of, of monkeys um, called the Pata, and they're based on Patas monkeys. And they ride upon these great big huge glyptodonts, uh, which are a relative of um, modern day armadillos. Real glyptodonts were huge, not this huge though. Real glyptodonts are about the size of a VW bug, but these are, you know, it, it's, it's, my, it's my world, so I made them huge. Um, and they, these monkeys also, they ride on desert antelope called Gemsbok and scimitar horned oryx and edax. And here's a couple of Arabian oryx. So it's one of these kind of grand epic type illustrations. And it's um, Buena Vista style um, wraparound uh, film aspect ratio too. So that was fun to make this book into movie um, aspect ratio. Well, here's a switch we saw in the previous um, slide that you're going on a kind of a really neat journey and everything looks rosy, even the colors were rosy. Well, this is earlier on in the story where Katuk is first banished and Katuk's in this basket underneath this big moa and they're you know, driving, driving him away and he's, the color is totally different and you're going down, down, down. Almost like, am I going into the Valley of the Shadow? Am I going into Dante's Inferno? And here's all the other lemur species saying, yeah, yeah, you know, he, he tipped the, the balance. Um, you know, let's, he needs to leave. And it's fun playing around it here because I'm playing around with these different kind of high, high. Um, um, I'm playing with injuries, um, lemurs. Um, the moas here are having like a little story, pecking at each other. And here, here we have some shifakas bouncing on the drum. and I'm, I'm, I'm having fun being like, you know, like uh, Ben-Hur or the Ten Commandments. And it's fun to be epic when you can. And here is towards the end where Katuk, here he is. And I do have much, many pictures of him, much larger, but um, where he is given a vision of an animal paradise where everybody, there's no fear, no pain, no eating each other. And it, it's almost in another dimension because the landscape goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. There's no end to this world. There's enough for everybody and, and such. Um, I've put some interesting illustration devices called cartouches to almost tell a little story in the end. Like kind of, here's the, like the kind of like symbolic peaceable kingdoms cartouches. A good device in traditional illustration, but it's fun to put it into a more concept style setting. So here's Quigga and he's happy. Um, everybody's happy. But um, his time's not, he can't, it's not time for him to stay here. He has to go back to his world his, and um, save his people. Well, we are in California, so we are pretty close by. Um, and at least we're, we're, we're closer here than we would be if we lived in Massachusetts. So um, a long time ago, in a studio pretty close by, just, you know, about two hours by plane. Well, you probably saw at least some of these movies, right? Maybe a couple of times, maybe once or twice. Okay. That happened. And it's still happening. <laughs> every year now, Disney promises every year, every year. We'll see. Well, here's how one of the characters happened. And this was before I was even tapped to work on the movie. I was working at Industrial Light and Magic, and I had just finished storyboarding the first um, Super Bowl Clydesdale um, Super Bowl commercial. Do you remember that one? The, the horses are all playing football and such, and so I had um, boarded out all, the, all the, that whole commercial. And that was a real marathon because these had to be very beautiful storyboards because the client, you know, hey, it's Anheuser Bush. And so it's like ILM wanted to say, look at our beautiful storyboards. And so these, I only had two days to do like these detailed horses and all these poses. And so I was like this way. I'm like, ah, oh, it's done. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. And I was um, waiting for my art director at the time, Mark Morris, to give me my next 
assignment, which I think was lip -sync, doing lip syncing design for Dragonheart. So I was just drawing, like rolling off steam, and this is how I was feeling. <laughs> I was actually feeling like this, like, oh. <laughs> oh I am. Um, and uh, so, but you know, I, I kept the little sketch. It was just my little sketch. And then when um, Doug Chang and I were moved up to Skywalker Ranch, um, they did that for, for security purposes. I just brought this little drawing with me and put it on my bulletin board up there. And every Friday, George Lucas would come up. Well, every Friday at the very minimum, he'd often pop up and announce. So we always had to be ready. Um, he saw saw this little drawing, and he really. And I, 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 was, I was so amazed. Um, he really liked the fretfulness and the uncertainty of this little, this little creature. And he wanted to keep those elements of this creature he wanted to design that for yet the next generation of Star Wars um, hope, um, um, people, young children, could see these movies, he wanted there to be a character that was safe for them. Because Star Wars, if you take out the comic relief, it can be very grim. You know, people die, they get blown up, they get eaten, um, bad things happen. It can be pretty grim. And so the character, one of, I, I worked on all the characters, but this particular character had to be a place of safety for the next generation of children. And he looked like many things in his development. He was a year and a half in his development even design, you know, dogs for him. This is like a Blarth. I had, I think, more fun doing the dog than I did this one. But, so he looked like many, many creatures, and we were just drawing um, a mile a minute. We had to draw so fast that, um, that, that, that there wasn't any time to do any real fancy um, digital stuff because we just had to draw, slap on a bunch of colors, slap, so that we had no time, and we didn't have the technology back then. Photoshop. Uh, back in the um, late 90s was like CS like one point and a half. So it would have been more, more longer to set the layers up, I mean, than it is obviously now. So we just had to just draw, 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 draw. More speed drawing. Um, these, are not, these are not perfect drawings, I see. I mean, and we're all our worst critics. But I, I see things that I wouldn't, but it, there wasn't time to be your own critic. You just had to get it out and say, okay. George is a very nice person. He, he treated us so kindly. And that is what the final development. I'm getting a year and a half. There, he looked like so many different animals. But uh, basically, this is the one that was the final, the final version. And then Ian McCaig designed the clothes and the costumes for him. And I said, that's fine. I'm, 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 I'm glad I brought it to this point and um, time to work on some, some other ones. But uh, one thing that we all need to relate things to reality. And with Jar Jar, he, need, he was one of the very first completely realized digital characters that had to stand on his own. Um, and so I wanted to, it was very important that I was able to inject a type of alienness into him. It was not, he doesn't walk like a human being. He was not meant to ever be a human being in a suit, nor was he going to be modeled like or animated like a person in a suit. So I had to think about how was he going to be animated and to make sure that his anatomy would allow that sort of animation to occur. Well, do you notice how very short his thighs are and how much longer his shins are. Well, there's a reason for that. When you see him walk, does he remind you of a particular type of animal when he walks? Anybody have a guess? I'll have to demonstrate. When you are also a um, concept illustrator and I've also animated as well, so I kind of did some animation for them as to some traditional animation to show how he would walk and how the, some of the other animals walked. And that was so neat because they brought a whole great big huge Glenn Keane style animation table and I wanted to keep it but they wouldn't let me. So, but anyway, so you need to think about that. And so he walks like this. This is how Jar Jar walks. 
What kind of animal walks like this? It's, you, know, you, you, can see, you see them every day. See them every day. Birds. Birds. That's how birds walk. And they have thighs that are very compact. And even though their ankle is, is up like that, um, I compensate for that by just giving him extra long shins. It was really a, a bear inventing how he kneeled, but we, that, we had to figure that out too because of the long shins. But that's what gives him the less human aspect. So animals teach you, they inform you, they, they allow you to do incredibly alien type things. Just like David was saying, when you're sometimes doing a creature that you don't want to say, well, it's, it's, I wasn't influenced by this or I wasn't influenced by that, yet he, he is correct in that all kinds of animals go into that pot to create what he came up with. These are the, ortho, the original orthographic drawings that I did that went to Industrial Light and Magic so that they could model the creature, they could model him. And for every single creature for Star Wars, I had to do the skeletons because this is what the riggers would use as their guides. And then they would model also the slave rigs to go on top. I also did all the muscular systems. And if I, but if I included all of that, this would be like a two day <laughs> talk. So I'm just showing some of these. Here's the anti Jar Jar. He's evil. This is Sebulba. And he was a lot of fun to do. Anybody have an idea of what animal he's based on? His head, anyway? Camel, yeah, dromedary. Again, this dromedary lived at the Oakland Zoo. He, but uh, it's so funny because Sebulba is like, if you stood on this table, he's this tall. And he has a really bad inferiority complex and takes it down to everybody. There's his orthographics. And it was really fun for him just to, be, just to drive home the point, I gave him the color of an Easter egg. So that's why he's, he contributes to his very, very bad mood. He drives with his hands and he walks. I mean, he, he drives with his feet and he walks with his hands. So he has a very spidery-like um, locomotion. Here's some more skeletons of some of the other pod racer pilots. They're all very funny. George um, Lucas asked me to just design a whole Dr. Seussian arc for, of creatures for the pod racer pilots. And this one here is a nod. Um, um, George Lucas's best friends, as you know, um, with Steven Spielberg. And as kind of a nod to his friend, he had me kind of do a little bit of a redesign of the alien that came out of the Close Encounters mothership that Steven Spielberg designed. <laughs> so that was fun. And if you see here, I've skewed the anatomy so it's not perfect on each side. I've given it some asymmetry because in real life, we are asymmetrical. We're not quite perfect. If you have something that's totally equally perfect on either side, you get an unreality. You get that uncanny valley. Are you familiar with that term, the uncanny valley? It means it's so real, but it's not. So you need to add some um, unbelievable, you need to add some imperfection. There he is again. He's just silly. Both Ian McKaig and I worked on this creature, and I, it was Ian's idea to put these little dingle bops <laughs> on him. <laughs> and I, I just really had fun with these knees. I loved these little silly, this is like the opposite of Jar Jar's legs. The insides are sometimes funnier than the outsides. Okay, this is how the two-headed announcer started out. And I really liked this one. I was inspired by um, Siamese cat twins, you know, Siamese twins and kittens, where it's kind of really creepy. They don't, and they're kind of attached like that, real diabolical, but George thought it was too scary for little kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway. Um, I took a more conventional, conventional approach to a two-headed monster or alien, but he was still fun. Uh, she was designed for the prequels, but she ended up in the Clone Wars. 
Like we just, just designed, just Uber designed so many creatures. And she's like a combination of dinosaur and parrotfish and primate and who knows what else. Here is one of the pod racers. This is a more recent illustration from this film. This is Team Topagilis. And here is a model sheet of Team Topagilis. This is Mrs. Pagilis. And they, here is Team To and some of the, a couple of the other pod racers. Like here's Clegg Holdfast. And um, they, oh, here's Sebulba, he, he likes sugar, the pure stuff. And they're ce celebrating the fact that they've survived yet another race intact and having tea and cookies, Star Wars style. And here's Nunes and, and stuff. But uh, it's just so fun to, to be inspired by real animals. Like he was inspired by seahorses. This one was inspired by um, Garanek antelopes and other types of antelopes called like diatags. Um, Timto was inspired by a macaque. So you can see a little bit of macaque in his face. Camel, little dinosaur. Obviously, human anatomy up in here, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, these are some of the sketches of the fishes that were done as they were swimming towards the Gungan city, and they're all inspired by real fish. Like, I was inspired by big groupers here, and um, and. Uh, Trigger fish, um, angel fishes, tuna type fishes, black swallowers, um, box fish. Uh, Star Wars is all about taking what we know on Earth and tweaking it a bit, to quote George Lucas. And here's OPC killer. And every single creature in the Star Wars universe has a backstory and a natural history. And there's the cola crawfish that eats the OPC killer. But always remember to chew your food or your food might come out of you because it's still alive. And here's the one that eats everything. This is the Sandu Aqua Monster. I think this is my, the favorite one I designed for Star Wars. It's huge. Um, does anybody know what animal inspired this? The main, main animal that inspired this? Can you take a guess? Yeah. A, Panther, a tiger, specifically, a tiger. That was the idea. Something at the top of the, ch of the food chain that's sneaky, that doesn't have to worry about much, that's lazy. Yeah, tiger, seagoing tiger. Um, one of the first things I needed to do was to design a lot of street scenes on Tatooine and to combine um, the classic characters, like these hammerheads, with new characters. So I did a lot of street scenes. That was kind of just exploring and seeing, making sure that anything new that I designed or what was going to be designed would mesh well with the established characters. And here's another one. Here, this is before the film was even cast. This is my stand-in drawing of Anakin and his mother. And she's talking to one of her neighbors. Um, you eventually you see the head of this appearing in the cantina scene of um, Star Wars, a special edition. So it's the pack of fifth. And go, we're looking into the, the, one of the alleys, and life is not really good there, you know, um, in, uh, on Tatooine. And here we go back to the pack of fifth. Um, they, these animals, these creatures, they walk on stilts and they wear long coats. And then um, that's when they want to interact with human people and they wrap their tails around their waist. Anybody who has a toy knows this to be true. Here is um, a recent, fairly recent illustration, I guess it's now it's about five years old, um, of Cat Wallapack of Fifth, kind of showing how he's constructed how he prefers to walk when he doesn't have his coat and his stilts on. Here's his anatomy. And let me show you what animal anatomy informed me, um, inspired me. Like I said, I do a lot of paleo reconstruction, paleo work. Here's an Edmontosaurus, a Canadian dinosaur. It's a type of duck-billed dinosaur. 
and I double checked it with uh, the paleo department at the University of California UC Berkeley to make sure that I was, his pose and everything else was feasible. Here is his anatomy. You can see that there's a direct application to Ketwal's anatomy. And his species are creature wranglers for the Star Wars universe. So if you want to purchase any OP, if you want to purchase a Rancor monster, which is probably not the best idea, but if you want to purchase one, you need to go to these guys and they will find one for you. This is Isray. This is for a book jacket um, that, was, I, that was for a spin-off of Star Wars Stories, Del Rey Publishing, um, shortly after the films came out. This is Isray, the reptilian princess. This is acrylic on um, gessoed um, illustration board. Obviously, I was inspired by various reptiles, like rucked um, lizards and things. I did a lot of, myself and Ian, and Ian McKaig, we did a lot of what became known, be known collectively as Jabba cuties for Jabba's den of sin and infamy. And so here's a couple of mine. I think I was listening to the B-52s that day with their beehive hairdo. Yes, it was a love, sh love shack, I guess. Um, let's see. Here's another Jabba cutie, a little bit more simian little fan dancer. And there is Jabba, about 30 years in the past. In the prequels, he was younger, obviously, and not quite as decrepit as he became. So here's a pretty, a fairly healthy Jabba, saying, let the race begin. Here's what's inside him. No, he's not a slug. He is actually a weird kind of salamander. He has got a big, thick backbone. And this was necessary for, in order for him to be animated. Here's his father. He has a cameo appearance in The Phantom Menace, if you watch closely. So I had to make him, give him a little more dignity, a little more wrinkles. And uh, so that's Frank. I did not name him. George named him. And if Jabba had a father, it, he obviously had a mother, correct? So I guess we sh we'll meet her. She also made a cameo appearance. If you watch closely, you'll see her too. There she is. That's, that's Gardula. Gardu that's baby Jabba. Um, this is Gardula the Hattes. And um, I think, uh, and she's wearing her, like her Frank Franzetta outfit here, just like Princess Leia did. So I think um, 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 Jabba had some issues, but we won't, we will not go there. Um, this is what a, gu a um, Gundark looks like. So when Luke is whining to his uncle and aunt at the beginning, like he, I'm tired of working about the, the wa with the water distributors and, the, and everything else, I wanna go hunt Gundarks. Well, you, that's a really bad idea, Luke, because they use the dark side of the forest and they're carnivorous and big and awful. And, but I was inspired by um, bonobo um, chimpanzees and little cute little squirrel monkeys for this very um, aggressive creature. Here is a Sith hound, a Takata, a uh, very, very dangerous animal. And I remember I was, I was inspired by Doberman pincers and Gavile crocodiles. Arthropods are always interesting challenges, especially if you want them to emote and to act. Uh, often we will cheat it a bit because an arthropod's facial structure is very rigid because the muscles are all um, enclosed within the skeleton. Our muscles are outside of our skeletons. So it's like a crab or a lobster or an insect. And so often what you'll see, you see this in many, many productions, we cheat it. For example, if you look at the eye, even though I gave it a, compa a compound lenses. But look at, the, look at the eye. It's more a mammalian or a reptilian eye. It has eyelids. It has wrinkles. It can, has, it can have a twinkle in its eye if it wanted to. And if you see the jaws, of course, I, I gave it mandibles. The 
um, the horizontally oriented mandibles that you do see in arthropods, but I also gave it more of a reptilian or mammalian jaw. So they're interesting. Um, with insects, you, if you don't do that, you need to make sure that their acting is very gestural and very pantomime. So they're, they're very interesting animals to, to feature design around. Here is a rancor um, species called the Tarantetac. Uh, it uses the dark side of the forest. This is for a project called the Book of Sith for Lucasfilm. And it, one of the rules in Star Wars is that if you use the dark side of the forest that you get red eyes and get pointier. <laughs> or, or, or similar to that. This is not Star Wars, this is switching gears. This is from Brave. So this is some of the early concept development from Brave and totally different um, aesthetic. Uh, this is was wanting to take advantage of Cel linear Celtic design. Pixar is brilliant in the extreme, in the beautiful design that they do in their characters. And so w I was incorporated these swirls and such into her fur. And at this point they were talking about, well, let's make her wasp waisted, like a Victorian lady. Well, bears don't really have waist like this. They're much more pear-shaped, but it's a cartoon, so it's okay. Here's some more um, early design work. Here's Eleanor. The Mordu got worse, worse looking. He lost a lot of hair and got more harpoons put in him. Here's some expression sheets. Eleanor is starting to look pretty much like the movie. Here's her proper proportions. And here are some of the other animals. So when you know anatomy, you are, then have the wings to set you free to be able to work in a lot of different styles, not just one style. So you can go from like hyperrealism to, you know, Disney type or, or extreme animation styles. But the principles of the anatomy still hold everything together. These were also used for Brave, but they were done years earlier for Brother Bear, so they had a double life. You know, Disney owns Pixar, so they said, hey, we already paid her once, <laughs> we don't have to pay her again <laughs> for these. And they didn't, but that's okay. Um, I adored working on Brother Bear. I, I was hired to do, to help go all the way from real bears to the more stylized characters. But the first thing they had me do is do tons and tons and tons. I did about 50 different sheets of just an, of, of, um, anatomy studies. The real, the bear that you see, the mus muscle planes, and then the fur track planes. Here's some more. It's really important to know what the bottom sides of the pads of animals look like when they're being animated. This is on also what, how the pads are in relationship to the body. Like this is the outside of the paw, the body of the bear would be here if we're talking about this forepaw. And, and also the body of the bear would be here in orientation of the hind paw. And then when the toes are spread, what does this look like? What does weight distribution look like? All kinds of things are very, very important in animation. I did a lot of work on the moose as well. Here's Rutten Took and some sequences. And here is where I'm stylizing down to the more released version of the bears. And how do you make moose talk? Here's the vowel model sheet so that they, the lips could be animated. Now we're going to talk about what happens when you give sheep guns. Well, we see all kinds of avatars in the science fiction world that are creature inspired. We've seen obviously um, primate inspired creatures. Uh, we've seen lizard people, right? Lots of lizard people. And we've seen cat people, especially blue ones. But we don't ever often see avatars for ourselves, that is species that can stand in for ourselves and do what we can do, that are based on hoofed mammals. So I thought, I'm going to take that idea and make it my own. And so here is from a series called Tales of Amalfia, which um, is based around a 
online course in creature design that I created. And it's all, just about all ready to go to alpha, so watch for that. But anyway, this is a bipedal hoofed mammal with a little bit of dinosaur -y added into him. And uh, these are some doodles I was doing, just kind of figuring out how he moved about and what he liked to do. And he likes to work out. He's really into working out and looking good and being powerful and whacking things. Well, I looked at real animals. Here is the largest of the antelope. This is a um, giant eland. These are huge. He is six feet tall right here. They're huge. If you don't believe me, go to the San Diego Wild Park. They're there. They're gorgeous animals, magnificent. And they're, of course, endangered. This is terrible. These horns are amazing, huge. Here is a reconstruction of a Shiva therium, one of the species of Shiva therium, a prehistoric giraffe. It was um, broader rather than taller, but immense animal. Some scientists think that made, it might have even had a small trunk because it has a very short nostril, rostral bone, but they're not sure. So I looked at that. I looked at bipedal dinosaurs, like this pelic pelican mimus. But the interesting thing about dinosaurs and birds is that their, their backbones, for the most part, held horizontal to the ground. And I wanted my character to be able to be more upright and be able to do things that you and I can do, like create art, make weapons, do buildings, whatever. So I did that. So I took all those elements together. They all, all inspired me. They're not one, any one animal, just as you know, David earlier was so, eloquent, so eloquently explaining when he was thinking of his creature process. But they remind you of other animals. There's a connection. So we've got some massiveness of the eland horn, but they're not quite the same. I made his head a little more blunt and hammer-like. But I gave him a human S-curve so that his default pose was uprightness. Well, but he's a very heavy animal. Look at these heavy horns. He had to have a counterbalance. So a big, long tail. Well, he can whack things with his horns. He can whack things with his spear. He can whack things with his tail. And he's 12 feet tall. His forepaws are the same model. If you look at a, a ploven hoofed mammal, like a cow or a sheep, they, they um, don't have a thumb. They have these like this. So I made it a four-fingered hand. Here's his musculature. Here's his x-ray. Here's when he's young. Here's some more related species. This is one of my favorites called the Hadax. I was in inspired by the beautiful color patterns of an antelope, which is just exquisite. It's called a bongo. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful antelope. I was also inspired by some prehistoric ungulates, hoofed mammals, like the, the Cinca, Cinca um, serototherium here. Here's a model sheet for, for the first one. He's an inlet. He's an Elendoran styra called Maha. Here are some related species. Here are some other species of rabbit-like horn things, because I, I like rabbits and rodents and things. Um, here's a kind of like what you call a Star Wars shot. That means you have a whole bunch of elements in a composition, but they all kind of have to work together, like the swirling action. And these guys are, are trying to chase this um, big, giant, pangolin-type creature away. And it's kind of a... Yeah, kind of a, a, a kind of like a finished rough, in other words. It's it's not a finished painting, but it's a drawing that gets the idea across. And when you're doing a concept illustration of this scale, you can have all kinds of this sort of thing. A director can t can look at different parts of it. I mean, it's all parts of a whole that work. I hope. But he can also look, well, I like this little section here. I'm going to do a couple of storyboards in this direction. Or I'm going to see what this guy's doing over here. And you can break this whole scene into several bunny trail scenes. So it's like a big bang for your buck type scene. Here is some paleo reconstruction for the University of California, UC Berkeley. They are the scientists that made the connection between Triceratops, here's a young Triceratops, and Taurosaurus. It turns out that the Triceratops matures into this, into this 30 foot long 
um, dinosaur called the Torosaurus. But happily for all of you who love Triceratops, Triceratops was described in the scientific literature earlier, so now we're calling the Torosaurus the adult Triceratops. So Triceratops did not go away like the Brontosaurus, he's here, or Pluto, he's here to stay. This is how the, the dinosaur is. This is the actual remains in the drawers. In paleo stuff, you're piecing these things together. It's very rare to find a fully complete skeleton from millions of years ago. This is the crest. These are various bone fragments. Here is the actual nose horn. And the incredible thing was about these, these aren't fossils, incredibly enough. These are actually real bone. You're holding prehistoric life in your hands. It's just amazing. Here's one of the, the brow horns. Jawbone, see the teeth? This is a baby triceratops. His head's about, and when he's all grown up and becomes a torosaurus morph, it's like longer than my arm much longer. I mean, my, my, lo my arms might be the head, but the crest goes, would go out beyond the Quonset wall there. It was so huge. Amazing. Good thing they were vegetarians. This is what, and so this is the conclusion that scientists have come up to as to how dinosaurs really existed and comported themselves. Well, the, the Avengers movie was coming out, you know, as you know, a, a few years ago. Uh, like 2012, and so I asked myself, this was just for fun, and it ended up going viral, but, if, but the funny thing is, is, you know, people like dinosaurs, people like superheroes, like, you know, it wasn't like a big scientific, you know, amazing genius breakthrough, it's just like, okay, well, what would happen if they auditioned for the parts, and what would it do to the costumes, and uh, that's what that did to Thor's costume, and and that's what, yeah. He needs help getting out of his costume and he has armor underneath his armor, so he's, yeah. So he's out to save hot dogs and apple pie and the American way and the next big idea and Ford Motor Company and all that good stuff. Um, here's Bruce Banner. Mild-mannered Navy scientist working out of the naval base at Pensacola, and then he got zapped by gamma rays, and that happened. Um, and he still can't scratch his chin, even though he's more muscly. He has, he is, he's, he has short arm impaired. So here's a whole bunch of doodles for them, just silly doodles, like getting tan and doing push-ups and um, drinking mead. That's Mrs. Thor, actually. Um, playing croquet, you know, surfing on rockets. So I was listening to air on the radio. And, you know. So there they are. So now we know about Vikings. People like the Viking series. And we know that Vikings are real tough guys like Thor. Well, that they were afraid of one thing that they were terrified in and that they believed in. So this is what um, these doodles are leading up to. Here's some more. I'm going to hurry on because I know we're running out of time. This is, I love horses, my favorite animal. I could draw and talk about horses forever, so don't get me started. So here's an Andalusian horse. These horses are used a lot in like movies like Lord of the Rings and unicorn movies and all those wonderful, beautiful hyper movies. These are Sc ancient Scandinavian breeds that the Vikings would have been familiar with. Here's an Icelandic horse. Here's some fjord horses. I just love it drawing horses. Here's some anatomy studies of the underside of a horse. Here's a young horse. And the inside thigh of a horse. Here's a prehistoric horse called a Hippidian. I love this beautiful skull. Look at this. I just loved it. So, give you more ideas. Well, whales. Well, ocean going. Vikings are in the ocean. Here is a Zygagon. Here is a beaked whale, which exists today. Very odd, but cool. That's how they're built. Basic mammal anatomy. Whales aren't that complicated as far as their anatomy goes. 
Horses have a lot more extreme anatomy than whales do. And this is what I came up with. This is an ocean-going carnivorous horse that likes to, to eat Vikings. And it's called a Havhest. And they believe this animal really existed. They were terrified of it. And so I kind of ran with that idea. This is going to be appearing in the book I'm currently working on called Bestiary, A Natural History of Mythical Creatures. It's supposed to be out in 2016, so I need to um, <laughs> work really hard. <laughs> Here's the anatomy. Here, okay, now I'm going to be working for a finished narrative illustration. So these are my doodles. And I like this one a lot because I experienced this when my, my little mare Goldie was in pain one day and she was rearing up on her hind legs and she was just crying, crying out loud. And if you've ever seen a horse in pain and they really are, oh, it's, oh my goodness, it's like a catastrophe. It just breaks your heart. It's, they're such magnificent animals. But anyway, she did get better, she was fine. Um, so this is, well, this is my view of her. She was like, she wasn't a large horse, but on her hind legs, she's like 12 feet tall. And I remember her mouth open and just in, just in terrible distress. So that image was always in my mind. And so years and years later, I, I incorporated it into this fairly recent um, illustration of a hat hest panning up here, emerging from the tidal wave. And she's like, ah. And you know you're going to die. And this is what the Vikings are seeing. <laughs> Be good to your horses. They never forget. Uh, here is a, also an illustration um, for uh, bestiary. What does a real chimera look like? Well, a real chimera in my, that I've at least tried to make is one that is, the female is the big one, and the male is smaller, and he rides on her back because they have vast territories, and it's hard to find mates. So like an anglerfish, it's convenient if the male hangs out with the female and is almost literally, either, if not attached to her, very well comfortable on her back, and his spines interlock with her spines. And so in silhouette, you'd see like this one animal, what looks like to be one animal, like a, a dragon-like animal with the head of a lion and the head of a goat and the tail of a snake, and I had fun trying to make it scientifically feasible. Here's some call-out illustrations. And the chimeras aren't afraid of much, but they are afraid of hippogriffs because these are carnivorous equines related to that have hest, where they leap, glide, and can pounce. So they have that advantage. I did a lot of research for this book. Here is another illustration. This is the Chinese catfish. Here is a um, creature from Romanian folklore, the calipus. It was a type of jackal, wolf-like-ish animal that had featherish-like quills. And it was shown on heraldry, and I was putting a more um, natural spin on it, what it could, might look like if it was actually real. Here is the Celtic black dog. Chases you across the moors, but it does have cute little puppies but they grew up to be like that. Here is a feline griffin, as opposed to the more reptilian one I did. It's a really bizarre type of cougar in which the um, canines and incisors fuse and form almost like a beak-like structure. It, does, it, it leap glides rather than it truly flies. It likes to eat hyraxes and clip springers and, and, and such. But I tried to have it do cougar-like cougar behaviors Here's a cactus cat. <laughs> this is from Tall Tales. This is like from lumberjack folklore of, of, of American and, uh, and um, Canadian folklore. Um, it's basically, it, it was a, it's a cat that can blend in with cactuses. So it's, it, it's, it has fatty pads and fat pouches and quill-like fur that look, helps it blend in with its environment and it likes to eat rattlesnakes. It's a kitten. The mother's eating the head. Here is the Arcadian Sphinx. It's sort of a, a cheetah relative, and this animal likes to eat us. But the thing is, is that 
I mean, Oedipus, Oedipus didn't also shouldn't have hung around because she told him a riddle, and we know what happened to Oedipus. But um, so it's like a, a cheetah, but with a, a higher forehead. So its for face proportion is more of human proportions, and has mesmerizing eyes, and it has like a mesmerizing voice, um, and it kind of lures you if you're so fascinated by its beauty, and it has these kind of hand-like. Um, Pause. So kind of, this would be like what might give the idea of a, of a woman's face on a cat's body. And these wing-like structures are actually to help it run. It's not wings, they're quills to help it bank it and run quickly like this. Here is also from um, Lumberjack Folklore. This is the axe handle hound. It's very mischievous. Uh, I was inspired by the casks on the heads of um, hornbills. And then my little dogs are with it and I kind of had him pose for me. I made him a little more substantial than my whip it is, but my, my, my little dog was very patient. Timmy, sit. Timmy, sit. Timmy, sit. <laughs> and he was. Greyhounds are great. They, they're very patient and they, they, will, they just want to be loved. Here is a Egyptian sphinx that maybe this animal inspired the statues. Here I gave this big cat more human proportions in its face, and then I, of course, blew out the mane and the, um, the flank fur out. And again, I'm looking at it as a natural history. Here are some more call outs for the Egyptian sphinx, and here's the lioness. This is here is the Namayan lion from Greek mythology. This is from American folklore. This is called the Hillside Gouger. And the interesting th thing about this animal is that it lives on hillsides, as the name implies, and it gouges out you know, chunks of rock, it, it eats grass, etc. cetera. And, um, but the males can only go around one direction, the females can go and go around another direction. When they want to move or go to another mountainside, they have to get together and move like one animal, like drunken sailors. And the reason that is, is because the legs on one side are a lot shorter than the other side. So you can imagine, one can only go, the females are oriented one way, the males are oriented the other way, and so they can only go in one direction until they come together like this. So here's a female showing how she is. And here they are together. People believed, people believed this stuff. It was incredible, they did. And that is the end. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't know if there's any time for questions or not. Uh, yeah, we have time for a few questions. Sure. Yes. It was my it wasn't me's idea. No, it wasn't me's idea. Um, I had nothing to do with the voice. It's like I pictured him more like talking. Hello, my name is Georgia Banks, and I sound just like Jeremy Irons. You know, I thought that'd be really cool. He'd be just as funny, but again, it's. It's, I, I was just the hand and, 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 and such, so. It's okay, yes. How long did it take you to come up with like a final design? If I had to think like that, it took me like five years. Uh huh. It's just curious, like on the. You mean this particular one or just the other ones? How long did you actually sit down and like use drum nails and like do some research? Well, you know, it, it's sometimes it's a case by case um, situation. What I think about first is what does this animal need to do? Where does it live? That really helps me. If I picture where it lives, it's natural history. And what kind of animals do the same thing? Where it is it in the food chain? The, no, the more I know about it, the more it helps me. Well, like for example, things like where it says cactus cat and it's supposed to be, there's some information where it's supposed to be some kind of a lynx. Oh, that makes it easy. Well, it's a kind of a lynx because that's already been established. But a creature, let's say like this guy, that one, 
can, can it depend, because there's another person in the mix, like, you know, I'm trying to design for somebody else's idea. That can take a little bit longer, because I'm trying a, lot, a bunch of different things. But again, some ideas, like, come really fast. And some ideas, it's like, oh, I'm like the most unimaginative person in, in the world today. It's like, and you just, at that point, I, I think about all kinds of animals, and then I draw lots of different shapes, and, and then I go outside, and then come back, and I give myself a break. And then often usually when, after I give myself a break, that helps, you know, just to go outside and move your body around. And yeah, so, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, it's, it, that schoolism course is full of animal anatomy. Oh, yeah. So you're going to probably go, yes, and you go, oh, no. Because <laughs> part of the lessons are you're going to have to draw um, anatomy. Yeah, yeah. But, mm -hmm. but that's the only way to do it. I mean, if you want to be a ballet dancer, you have to take ballet class every day. Yeah, so, yes? Um, you normally have limitations to uh, how many creatures you can melt together? Um, not really. I, I don't have, I mean, I might have a little tiny influence. I might like have some, a couple of creatures that are like maybe the primary influences, and then there might be like grace notes of other little creatures. So I don't really give myself a limit but if we look at nature, nature is really efficient. Na designing nature is really efficient. So the more efficient your creature is, the more efficient its silhouette is, usually simpler is better. Mm -hmm. Yes? Oh, yes. Yeah, flowers are really good ones. Um, I did recently some that were um, kind of inspired by orchids, because orchids are pretty, yeah, anything that has a beautiful form. Um, sometimes certain seed pods are really, really cool. Um, yeah, um, whatever it has a beautiful shape, absolutely. Anybody else? Yes. Um, what, what are some of the challenges that you still face now as you have to deal with so many creatures on a daily basis? Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It's a never ending study. Yeah. Yes. And so we have the, the final design among designers, bone structure. Uh, do you look at those all at the same time, or is there a method? Oh, very good question. I have two answers for you. When, if it's, if it's say like, oh, an imaginary animal that doesn't exist, I usually come up with a surface design first. Um, and it's informed by the anatomy I already know, but I come up with that first. Okay, and then I design the skeleton to fit, and then I hang the muscles on it. But in paleo illustration, where you have a fossil, it exists, you can't argue with it, right? Well, then you start with the bones, and then you hang the muscles on it, and then you put the surface on it. So, the one is one way, and the other, you invert the process. Uh huh. Um, when we talk about the way nature freezes, yes. The comment in the conversation we had was that when we're looking at the anatomy for our school, we're looking at the surface muscle. We're looking at the muscle closest to the surface, which is the most important. Because in a 2D world, we want to draw those things out and bring them one from its own. However, when you jump into the Russian lion and jump into the 3D world, those deep tissue muscles are the mm -hmm. muscles that build the form. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, that, and that's, a very good, that's a very good point. Um, I had the advantage in that my background is not really an art background. Most of my background is, I was a vertebrate zoology major and, and paleo major, and, I, and I, did, I did do dissection. So what Travis is saying is true, is that a lot of times what we see on the surface, and like the surface in animal anatomy books, those muscles, like trapezius muscles, uh, like latissimus dorsi muscles, like erectus abdominis muscles, are very thin sheet-like muscles. So the muscles underneath, the muscle bundles underneath, are the ones that actually hold those up. And it is very difficult, unless you look at veterinarian texts, to find art books that uh, show those, those muscles. And um, that is where at least traditionally in my experience, has been up to the student or an artist to really pursue and really find those sources. Look at the veterinarian books, look at the paleo books for those types of things. And yeah, there should be more um, out there for, as a resource. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're going into the different big retailers, mm-hmm. um, what are you noticing in there? What, what are they getting into? Is it a fur track type thing? Or what, what's yeah. Is there kind of a theme that mm-hmm. you have over and over when you install it? Uh, well, fur tracks is, is, is one because that's a real kind of a specialized area, but, you, but it is important because fur falls a certain way on living creatures. And then if you add in elemental things like wind, et cetera, I mean, um, that's, that's important to note. Feather tracks, the, the way feathers are arranged on a bird's body and to realize there's all, certain, all kinds of feathers, not just the ones we see, but there's contour feathers, there's down feathers that create so much volume on a, on a bird's body. Um, I would say, it seems to me a really hard thing when I go into studios. It's what I call the uncanny valley, where it's much cr- easier to design imaginary creatures um, in a certain sense because they don't exist in nature. There's no comparison. But where studios struggle a lot is trying to design real animals that we can believe in. Uh, I've seen lots a good number of movies where we'll have like this, you know, you know, pretty decent dragon or dragon-like monster. And then you have armies of people on horseback and the horses are awful. <laughs> and, I, and it's like, horses are all around us. You can go and you can, they will stand there. They're very patient animals. You, you know, they're, they're very happy to stand there for you and say, okay, draw me. And, or I will, or put a rider in the back. I will gallop for you. And I, I don't understand why that same care. Here it is. <laughs> it's here. Isn't put into that, especially when the bulk of creatures that you see in films and movies are real animals. I mean, how many times a year does Avatar come out? You know, it, it doesn't. So I think the disconnect between people, let's say, in you know, modeling creatures in their, in their studio or their cubicle and never coming out t- and going and looking at animals and really paying attention is, it, it, it comes home to roost. And you have to take that break to, to, to really look at, at creatures. Once, you know, even if you're drawing in the zoo and obviously unless the animal's sleeping, you're only going to be able to get at best gestural things, but your brain is remembering, it's keying in. So when you go back and you're animating, you're modeling, I remember how that 
my little sheep did this. I remember how the tiger did this. I remember that. And so I would just, I think, encourage people to, in order to do a good creature, a good animal, you need to really love that animal and, and look at it as something that's precious, just look at it as precious, and then that hopefully will trickle down into what you're trying to achieve. It's, it's an interesting question I ponder a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.